Today we start a new series, and this series is called uh, Multiply. Now, interestingly, uh, you, you know, this series we're going to be talking about biblical giving and generosity. And I know as soon as those words escape my lips, someone goes, ugh. You know, the church is often accused of, uh, you know, maybe you've heard this accusation before. Well, that, that church only cares about my money. Often there's a lot of heart, heartburn uh, when it comes to uh, uh, talking about finances in a church. Uh, people say, well, all the church wants my money. We re- here's the, here at Leesburg, we rarely discuss money. We, we, we don't talk about it much. In fact, our new folks often, when I'll have conversations with them about being involved, they'll say, John, we love Leesburg. We want to be a part of the ministry here. We want to place our membership here. We want to, uh, but here, how do we give? Because we don't pass a plate. Maybe you realize we don't pass a plate here ever. Um, uh, we're definitely not going to pass it twice, you know. Uh, reach in them jeans and pull out them greens. We don't, we don't, we don't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, we don't do that. Uh, uh, and, and, and when you leave this room, you'll see on the exit doors there are giving boxes, that, uh, which should be, uh, I should just take a moment and point out, there are giving boxes and then there are trash cans, all right? Two very different things, all right? Uh, uh, so, so be aware of that, but, but we don't, we, we don't emphasize it. Here's the thing here at Leesburg, we believe, uh, this is God's church. God's going to take care of his church. All right. So we don't worry about like, we're not beating people over the head about money because we believe it's, it's, it's God's church. But sometimes we have to talk about finances because the Bible talks about finances. In fact, in the new Testament, Jesus talks about money more than anything else. It's important for us to talk about biblical finances, a biblical view on money and possessions, because here's the thing, if we don't address it, if we don't deal with it, if we allow the culture and the world to shape our view of it, well, here's the thing, we're entering Thanksgiving and Christmas season. If we embrace the idea of our culture, then come January and February, we're going to be paying for it and paying dearly. Think about this, moms and dads, as we approach this Christmas season, if we're teaching that Christmas and, and, and this holiday season is about what you receive instead of what Christ gave, what God gave, then we're training a generation of people to be more self-absorbed into what I get out of this. What's in it for me? We need to deal with biblical generosity and giving because the Bible deals with it. Because it, 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 discipleship requires us to do that. We've, we've defined discipleship in the past several weeks as a disciple, someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. Well, if, if that's the case, well, listen, discipleship demands that we deal with giving and money because our relationship with it really matters. God's word deals with money and possessions quite a bit. And why? Well, could it be that the devil uses the physical world to fool us, to deceive us? This has been his plan since the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, we have Adam and Eve in the garden. Everything is theirs, all but this one tree. And Satan uses that one physical thing to to shift their focus from the spiritual reality of what was going on. Satan uses the physical to distract us from the spiritual all the time. First Timothy, uh, Paul warns Timothy in verse 9, he says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful uh, desires that, that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, it's through its craving that some have wandered away from faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, now the interesting th- thing here is uh, um, those who desire to be rich, he starts off by saying. Now, we say, well, I don't desire to be rich. I just want all of my needs taken care of and, and my wants. <laughs> and I've never seen a sad person on a jet ski. And so... If we can take care of that too, uh, um, but 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 here here's my here here's the point. Uh, our culture screams, the goal is prosperity. 
Our, our, our world screams it. You can have this now and pay later, and sure enough, you end up paying later. Prosperity is not a, has not been a good thing here in America. Here, here we, we, we are among the, the world's richest people, regardless of where you stand in this room today, a, a, among the world's richest people. But, but how has that helped our culture? In, in our world today, we, we have an incred, incredibly high abortion rate, high, incredibly high suicide rates, incredibly high divorce rates. I was reading a study this past week. It talked about how here in America, because of our prosperity, we uh, uh, go through the charts with the amount of time wasted. Because time's a commodity as well. We have the most amount of time wasted. It turns out that if you have to carry water five miles a day to live, you don't have time to do dumb stuff. And yet, here in America, we almost invent new ways to be evil daily. Prosperity has not gone well for us. And so we look at God's word, and, and interestingly, where we fall today is Matthew 25. If you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to, 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 to bring it with you each week, but, uh, but follow along if, if you will. Uh, in Matthew 25, Jesus is addressing a concern that, that his disciples have brought up. In Matthew 24, Jesus has been talking about his return and, and him inaugurating a new kingdom. One, one day, hear this, one day Jesus is returning. He, he, he's coming back and, and the disciples said, okay, Jesus, uh, tell us what it's going to be like when you come back. What, what should we expect? And, and, and so to tell them what to expect, tw Matthew 25 happened. And he gives them a couple of warnings. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the cat out of the bag on the front end. And then we'll go through the text and we'll see it brought out. His first warning is basically be ready. Because no one knows when. Jesus is coming back and you need to be ready now because we don't know when that's going to happen. Be, be ready. Secondly, he, he warns them that there's going to be an accounting for what you've done. There's going to be accounting for the types of things you did and what you did with what he gave you. It's a warning to the disciples and to us. Let's, let's, let's look at this. We'll read through it and we'll talk through it. In explaining what the kingdom of, of heaven will be like, Jesus told them this. Of the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The, the foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks with oil and with their lamps. Flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they, came, they all became drowsy and they slept. And at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come meet him. All the virgins then rose and, turned, and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will be not enough for us or for you, rather go to the dealers and buy for yourself. Now let's pause there. Well, what time is it? <coughs> Midnight. They didn't have uh, Walmart. All right. Is Walmart still open 24-7? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it isn't. Whatever. Random. John Focus. Um. Go, go to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Well, it's midnight. You're not, you're not waking somebody up. To, to, okay. While they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. Afterwards, the virgins came also, saying that that's the foolish ones. Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know you. And here's the warning in verse 13. Watch, therefore, he says. For you neither know the day nor the hour. You don't know the day or the hour. And so the whole idea here is be ready. Now, to understand this, we need to understand a little bit of the culture because it's different than ours. In this day, a, a wedding happened a lot different. Uh, for the majority of human history, and it's like some of you teenagers and early 20s are going to say, I, um, uh, I don't like this idea, but think about it. Just, just hang with me. For the majority of human history, arranged marriages have worked a lot better than following your heart. 
In, in this point, in this point of history, arranged marriages were common. And here's how it would work out: a fo- two fathers would get together and they'd say, "Okay, uh, let's let's marry our children off." They'd work out an agreement. The en- engagement would happen from the time your children were young. Uh, the children had no contact. Uh, we're taught here from this historic, this just historical fact. Marriage worked like that. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying. It, I'm just saying. All right. Uh, it, it, but it does teach us this. So, sorry. Uh, I'm just saying this. Uh, it, it shows us that marital love is a commitment and not a feeling. Someone's got to hear that. Marital love is not a feeling. It's a commitment. So you had an engagement. And then uh, uh, when they were betrothed to be married, that was a year before they were actually married, uh, they would be betrothed. And so at that point, vows would be spoken from the groom and the bride, but there would be no physical contact. There would be no consummation of the marriage. From that point on, you couldn't separate. You couldn't call off the wedding uh, without a legal divorce. That's why when we're introduced to Mary and Joseph in the New Testament, we see that Mary was betrothed to be to, to Joseph. She's in this uh, uh, point where there's no physical contact, but in order to be uh, uh, separated, there has to be a legal divorce. At this point in, uh, in, the, in the engagement process or betrothal process, uh, if the husband were to die, if the man were to die, uh, she would be considered a, a, a widow who is a virgin. And we see that uh, throughout the Old Testament uh, described. During this betrothing period, a man would demonstrate that he could provide for his wife. And and, and that's the setting in which this parable happens. It's the betrothed period. The groom is off with his wedding party. And after the year then, the groom and his groomsmen would come and he would collect the bride and her bridesmaids. They would, they would, they would go and, and there would be a, a communal feast and celebration that would last a week. The groom would come to the bride's house and get her and they would then parade through the town, usually the longest route possible, in order to be celebrated. And everyone would say, yeah, good for you guys, good for you. Maybe they'd give them uh, toasters and stuff. Um, maybe. Uh, they get to the house, the groom's house, and, and at that point the week-long feast would begin. Still, there would be no consummation of the marriage. There would be a celebration. Eating and drinking and partying uh, uh, for a week. And finally, after that week was over, then uh, the husband and wife uh, would be joined in hand. And, and they would consummate. And finally, everyone else would leave. Everyone would go home. And, I mean, can you imagine a week-long party with people? I can't imagine. After about two hours, I'm done. <laughs> go home. Uh, but that's a different culture, I guess. It, this is the setting in which we find this, this, this conversation about the wise and the foolish. The, the wise are ready, but the foolish are not. The, the wise are ready and, and responsible, the foolish are not. Here, let's look at the foolish. The, the, the foolish, they knew something was coming, but they weren't prepared for it. Now, now I think it's interesting, they, they looked the part. They were bridesmaids, right? They looked the part. They, 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 they appeared to be ready. They had a torch even. But they weren't ready because they didn't have oil. It reminds us that those who profess Christ, there are many who profess Christ but don't live like it. They look the part, but they're not ready. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're saved. It, it reminds us that the kingdom of heaven is not those who, who simply respond to an invitation. The bridesmaids were bridesmaids. Okay? They were happy to be bridesmaids. It, this passage reminds us that the kingdom of heaven is not for those who merely express some type of affection toward the, the groom or Christ. In verse 11, they said, Lord, Lord, open up to us. They were happy to be a part of the wedding party. It reminds us that positive thoughts toward Jesus will not be enough. I, I think it's interesting and kind of concerning you have half of the wedding party who's prepared and half who isn't. In other words, you have half of the people who are saved and half who are not. Now, I'm not saying that half of those who call themselves Christians will be saved. I'm not saying that. 
But I think it's important to point out that there's a significant of those who profess to follow who in truth do not. We look at this parable of the, of the ten virgins and, and there's a few things that we learn. We learn that some things can't wait till the last minute. We, we can't wait till the last minute to get our things in order. So often we fall into the trap of, well, I'll get that taken care of later. But what happens when the bridegroom returns? And he finds us not ready. I think of taking a test. Remember back in school, if some of you got to think way back. Remember back in school, it would be foolish to wait until the test is passed out to begin to study. Too late. That ship has sailed. Why is it we treat our relationship with Christ like that? We kick the ball down the field. We'll deal with it later. This passage teaches us that some things can't wait till the last minute. Secondly, it teaches us that some things can't be borrowed. The foolish, uh, uh, the foolish virgins here in this passage, uh, they needed oil, and they asked, hey, can we have some of your oil? And the wise said, no, i got to take care of my own oil. Get your own oil. Go find, find it somewhere. You know, go, go shop for it. Whatever. It, it, it reminds us that, that, that some things can't be borrowed. Guys and gals, someone else's relationship with the Lord is not going to satisfy our need. I'm sure mom or grandma were fantastic, God-fearing people, but what's that to do with you? What's that to do with you? Someone else's relationship with the Lord is not going to satisfy your need. The lesson from this first 14 verses is that we need to be prepared, that we need to be ready. But it's not just being prepared and being ready. There's more to it, and that's why Jesus continues, and he gives us another picture. He says in verse 14, uh, For it, the kingdom of heaven, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them whose property? His. Not theirs, his. So this man calls his servants together and entrusts to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. Each according to his ability. And then he went away. The one who had received five talents went at once and traded with them. And made more talents, five more talents. <coughs> so also he who had two talents went and made two more. Here's the picture we need to see. Those who've been entrusted by the master took what was their, their master's and put it to work as if it's their own. Why? Because they want to act responsibly with the master's funds, the master's resources, what's been entrusted to them. Look at the contrast here in verse 18. The one who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of these servants came and settled accounts with him. And to the one who had received five talents, he came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me to me five talents. Here I have made five more. And the master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh, to hear those words. And then he went to the one who had ten towns, uh, two talents, and he came forward and he said, Master, you've delivered to me two talents. Here I made two more talents. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. And enter into the joy of your master. Notice here, he doesn't say two. The other guy got five. Remember, the, the master gave each according to his abilities. Hmm. Look at verse 24. He who had received the one talent came forward. Look what he says. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. 
just to let the cat out of the bag here, this servant says, hey, master, it's your fault. It's because you're such a tight person. It's because of, it's because of who you are is, is what caused these results. He said, I was afraid because you're such a hard man. So I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what's yours. The master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. If, if that's true, <clears throat> excuse me, if that's true, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. Then at my coming, I would have received what's mine with interest. So then he, in verse 28, he, he looks to his guards. He says, take from this man and give it to him who has 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast this worthless servant into outer darkness, in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a warning. What a warning for you and I to hear today. You know, often we, 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 we get bought into the popular idea of Christianity and the church and, and even Christ's return. And we think, well, you know, listen, God, God's got me. God's got me. When Jesus comes back, it's going to be all grace, baby. But the warning here is that there's going to be an accounting. There's going to be Judgment. When Jesus returns, there will be a judgment. Uh, we've got to learn as a society, as the church, to read God's word and take it for what it says. Not the way I want it to be. Because here's the thing. We either need to stop reading the scriptures, which I would advise you not to do, Stop reading and just disregard all this. But here's, or, here's what you can't do. You can't read the scriptures and then make up your own result. Jesus says very clearly that there's going to be a judgment. So let's look at this, this passage and see what we can learn. What do we know about the master? Well, we, we know that this passage starts off with the master entrusting to his servants, giving to his servants. Contrary to popular belief, love is not what you receive, but rather what's given. John 3.16 says, as you know, God so loved the world that he gave. The, the master in this account loves because he is given and entrusted. He's entrusted. To two of the servants who responded, they responded positively to the expression of love and trust from the master. The, the, the picture we have there is, wow, he's entrusted me with this. I need to be responsible with this. I, I'm, I'm going to take it, I'm going to put it to work so that I can, I, I, I can bring it back to my master when that day comes. And hear those wonderful words, well done. Come join in, your, come join in your, the joy of your master. Two responded favorably. Wow. But the third, look at what he says. He says, I know you're a harsh man. See, see, see th this servant has a skewed view of his master. But even if that were so, He's not even consistent with his own thinking. If you knew I was a hard man, which he's not saying he is, if, that's, if you were true and accurate in your description of me, the master says, you, you, you'd put your money to work. You'd at least put it in the bank so it gets interest. In other words, you're not even being consistent with your own view because your issue is not with me. Your issue is with you. This lazy servant had an improper view of his master. He also had an improper view of the gifts that he had received from his master. What do we learn? Well, we learn that the master thinks it's all his. What has been entrusted to, to the servants 
belongs to the master. And here's some hard truth for us to realize. What's been entrusted with you and I belong to our master. What we have has been given to us. We say, well, no, I earned this. This is mine. I earned this. I worked hard for this. I, I, I did this. God didn't do this. I'm here to tell you, not according to the master. Oh, and I'm not just talking about finances. In fact, that's way down on the, the wrong for me. Moms and dads, your kids aren't your kids. They're little monsters. <laughs> just kidding. Your kids aren't your kids. They've been entrusted to you by God. And so let me, let's just think about this for a second. If your children have been entrusted to you by God, are you being responsible with the children that you've been entrusted with? One day there will be a reckoning. Am I being intentional with my time, with my energy, with my resources, with what I have? Am I being, am I being faithful? And will I be found faithful in how I deal with these children that God has given me? Hmm. Notice here what we learn about the servants, what we learn about ourselves. We have each according to the, to, uh, uh, the master gave each according to their ability. The master didn't compare the, the servants to one another. He gave what was, uh, what you were able to deal with. It's not based on what they have, it's based on what they could do. God has given us, based on our ability, the question is what will we do with it? In other words, use what you have, not what you don't have. So often we put these mile markers in our heads. Well, if I could get this taken care of and get this done, if only I could have this resource that someone else has, then I could do a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, um, I used to be so frustrated with God. You know what I would love to be able to do? I'd love to be able to stand up and sing. Pretty. Sorry, I got to put that qualifier in there. I'd love to be able to do that. Man, I'd love to be able to do that. I would love to be able to sing and, 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 and it sound good and not like a, a lawnmower in the background or embarrassing to those around me. Uh, I can sing loud, just embarrassing. Man, what a wonderful gift that would be. If only I could sing like Matt Simpson. Oh, man. But God's given each according to our ability. Maybe my giftedness isn't his giftedness. But what's my gift in this? The New Testament teaches that the body of Christ is like a body, and each person, each part has a purpose. We might say, well, you know, I mean, who wants to be the armpit? No one wants to be the armpit, right? Let's be a hand, let's be active doing something, let's be the eyes or the mouth, let's be ears. I mean, those are, I mean, they're not pretty, but they're, it's better than an armpit. No one wants to be the armpit. Sometimes we get part envy. We say, um, God's given us what we need. God's given us what we need. Here's my question, and I'm, and I'm wrapping up. Do you submit to the king? Have you submitted what you have to the king? For the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about multiplication. That's this series. And guys and gals, God expects multiplication. It's not just talking about money. Here's the thing. In the same gospel, Jesus says, don't store it for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. <coughs> Excuse me. But instead, store it for yourselves treasures in heaven where, where rust and moth don't destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. This isn't just about money. It's about time and energy and resources. All that we have, my life is yours, God. Can you say that? Will you say that? So, so I'm done. I'm wrapping up. I just want to ask you to, to consider this warning in Matthew 25. God is a loving God who has given gifts to you and to me. My question for us today is, are we using those gifts with intentionality? Am I using my gifts, my money, my resources, my time, my abilities, my talents, am I using those in the church? Am I using those in the home? 
Am, am I serving Christ with all that he's given me? Here's the thing. The bridegroom's returning. Christ is returning. And the warning in Matthew 25 is be, res, be ready. Be prepared. Be responsible. No one knows the time or the hour. But we do know this. We know that God expects what he's given to be put to work for his purposes. We are stewards responsible for what's been placed into our care and trust to us. And so let's work hard to maximize his resources. For the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about this. Really leading up to not, not just, not just um, our financials. Of course, we've got our Thanksgiving offering coming up. On the 19th, however, also along with the, the, the Thanksgiving offering, uh, we're going to have the foyer set up and we're going to be looking at all the different areas and avenues of ministry throughout Leesburg, specifically missions focused. I want to ask you to be praying about and considering as we go into the series, all that you have, your money, your time, your energy, your resources, your talents, are you putting those to work? One day, he's returning. Be ready. Be responsible. Let's pray.